All right. Um, and so, yeah, really, but thank you guys for having me. It's really uh, cool to be a part of this. Um, I've been involved with, uh, I originally was in software uh, before I got into architecture. And the reason I switched out of that, I felt it was kind of a soulless industry, uh, profit driven. And I thought, well, maybe there's a way to apply that. And so I've taken all these diverse things I've done in the background, everything from uh, welding and electrical and cooling systems and greenhouses back in the day and uh, kind of bring it all together. This is that one place that lets me do it, what we do in the lab now. So uh, while I've been here though at New School, I worked on uh, a thesis. And so I kind of wanted to talk about that today because it fits well into the whole concept of parametrics and digital fabrication. So in order to kind of predicate this whole conversation, uh, it's, this is something that could obviously be a whole we could spend the entire session discussing nothing but acoustics and architecture. But um, I was drawn into it uh, because it's something I hadn't studied. So I, this is a very, very, as I say, abridged version of uh, acoustics and architecture. Uh, but uh, so back in the day uh, when the Greeks were doing architecture, uh, acoustics was very important because they didn't have active systems like we say. The difference in acoustics, we talk about active. The microphone's active. Passive is the sound of the speakers bouncing off the back wall. So that's a passive wall, an active system. So they didn't have that, so they developed these theaters where a single performer could be heard throughout the stands because they understood this was important. And that allowed them to fill these uh, large uh, arenas and, and have the performances that they did. So the architecture was sort of serving the function that they needed. Um, briefly, a lot of times uh, people think of Gothic cathedrals as um, it's all about uh, ornamentation uh, is related to attracting the populace or making the structure look lighter. But there's also a lot of theories about uh, those actually improving the acoustics as well to try to disperse sound and create more balance because you know with the size of these spaces that would have been very difficult. Uh, there's some great stories about how they actually would uh, write specific like cantata music to fit one specific hall because of reverberation time. And so it's, it's a really fun when you get into it. Uh, acoustics was a big part of architecture. Uh, back in the day, and even uh, when you look, this was one that's just kind of a nice example. This is uh, what they call uh, echo spaces where reflections can be heard across the dome. And it's one of those fun ones that it was there and it was created, and it was comprehended, but it didn't happen until more like turn of the century where we could actually mathematically describe why it was occurring. So the acoustics were being put in place even though they didn't understand the mathematics behind it. So uh, we get into the turn of the century now, we're jumping ahead a bit. Uh, this is what I consider kind of the, and many people do, the sort of birthplace of uh, computational, mathematically based acoustics. Uh, this was the uh, Fogg Lecture Hall at Harvard. It was notoriously bad for lectures because nobody could be understood in the room because it had terrible acoustics. It had a very bad reverberation rates. So they asked this gentleman who had a PhD in physics. He was dealing nothing with acoustics. Acoustics really wasn't a science at the time. Uh, so they asked this gentleman, Wallace Clement Sabine, to try to fix uh, Fog Hall. It actually, they thought he could do it in a month. He spent three years because he was so fascinated by working on it. So, uh, But to give you an idea then real quick what he was dealing with. So this is real simple behavior of sound because sound travels as waves throughout a space. And when it interacts with the surface, it's going to do <coughs> basically one of four things. It's either going to go through, and that's when your neighbors can hear you with your stereo. Uh, absorption is when that sound hits the wall and then it stops. Is that me too loud? That's me talking too loud. That's sorry, that's me. Uh, so the absorption. Uh, reflection is the other thing that happens. So reflection is when that sound bounces back off the wall, back into the space. Then we get diffusion, which is essentially reflection, but it's dispersing that sound across. Um, it's dispersing into a wider area. So those four things are pretty much what create most of the uh, acoustics within the architectural environment. So the ones we really focus on here are going to be about absorption and reflection because that was where the first research was done and where the understanding was of how important this was. So reverberation time, that's something that we're all familiar with. Maybe we don't know the specific numbers, but we're all aware of it when it's wrong. So if we look at uh, the charts like this that we've now established, this is what, again, our friend uh, Mr. Sabine had to study, when you compare like here, I, I think so you guys can see it, yeah. So we're looking at somewhere around half second in a classroom to symphonic music being two seconds. I believe the fog hall was somewhere around seven seconds reverberation rates, so it was impossible to understand. So he wanted to understand how to control it. So he came up with what's called the Sabine calculation. 
which is still in use today. It was how can we look at the surfaces, look at the volume, and determine how the sound, how long it will take for the sound to decay. And that's a really important thing. So what it is, is we look at a 60 decibel drop, but essentially if I'm speaking and then you can no longer hear my voice. And there's a certain route of decay there. So he actually was able to quantify that. In order to do so, he also had to invent the idea of absorption coefficient. So he sat around and tested all the materials he could find as to how effectively they were able to absorb sound. And then he used that data to drive the calculation to actually determine how to fix it. So this is something that's very common today. This is acoustic absorption of materials. Uh, so you can see way up at the top, we have things like concrete, very reflective. We all know that intuitively. But as you can see, it absorbs very little to things like acoustic board, which would like be if we put acoustic material on the back of the wall. It's absorbing at a factor of about a one. So some of the most absorbent material we can find. So again, he went through and uh, determined absorption. He determined how to calculate it and also started to establish what is uh, response times that are desirable. And that's where um, acoustics is still what they, it's a, it's a, a, a psychological art as well. It's not just a mathematical art. So we can define a lot of things, but everything on those charts is called preference. So when we look at this, we're actually saying most people prefer their conference rooms up here. Most people prefer their choir sound to have the certain rate of reverberation. But the thing is, it really changes by the performance. And if we take the same room like we do nowadays in architecture, we take a multi-purpose room, and we try to have a choir perform in it, and we try to have a conference that following afternoon, the room that's impossible that it's going to match the reverberation times of that. So we try to deal with it now in many, many different ways. But they're all pretty much, again, the passive solutions that we see are uh, adaptations of really simple technology. We put a heavy drape in the back of the wall to slow down. We reveal it when we want more reflection. We've gotten a little more sophisticated with things like this. This is out of a company called RPG. Uh, these are diffuser panels which help diffuse sound, and they're a little bit adjustable. So what was difficult for me, though, as I was doing this research for my thesis was, since sound is constantly changing, but our methods are not, they're not very accurate and they're not very uh, expedient. How can we then actually change sound more dynamically? So looking at that, I thought, well, apparently, if you go back to the Sabine calculation, if you can absorb, you can change the absorption coefficient dynamically, then you should be able to affect reverberation rates dynamically. So based on that, I thought about, okay, well, if I made a system, a digitally driven system that can vary that, uh, the most obvious solution was to come up with a pattern of shapes that I could rotate or open, kind of like a set of louvered blinds or something, reveal a surface and conceal a surface. I took the approach of using tessellated forms. Um, here's a couple of the examples, but then right away I realized, well, I'm just randomly picking diamonds, triangles. I don't know how they're going to work. I don't know how they're going to perform. Um, but it's like, okay, well, let's kind of move forward with a couple of different ideas to try to then determine what's going to be more successful. So we have here like one of the diamond forms. I arrayed them out in a panel as if, so what we're looking at here is green is our reflector surface and the purple is an absorption surface. Very simple in the digital model for me to manipulate those then. Uh, what I did is actually could create a rotational axis. It's what you see in the panel outside, but each like even an odd one is on its own axis and they can be rotated. So I just model the different forms so I could test them. And to go into the idea of doing uh, digital testing on it, I started looking at some of the traditional tools, uh, traditional acoustics. And again, there's a very, very expensive software that will give you some very accurate readings on what the acoustics are of your space, what the estimated reverberation time is. But they're all really static. You do it one test, and then you can go back in and remodel all the walls and run the test again, and it'll tell you. But they don't have the parametric uh, capabilities that we would need in order to start to compare this. And fortunately, we've already discussed parametrics and fitness as well, since Ben brought that up. So I'll try to keep that part brief. Uh, so since there wasn't such a system, I came up with my own ray trace engine. Again, the concept is not unique. but uh, for what I wanted to do, I needed to build my own. So I built a ray trace engine and uh, grasshopper. And the ray trace engine, what it did then, would shoot rays at the panel. And then as the panels would rotate, it would allow, it would determine how many of them reflected back. So we can picture in this really simple example, um, 
we shoot up 100 rays at it, and then here, 100 of them land back on the bottom. But if the panels start to open, a certain percent get absorbed in that. And so I took the parametric control of the panel, and then I gave it to, yeah, and actually, I, I got to be honest, I'm sorry, Len did all the, the parametric coding for me, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I used the uh, Galapagos, an evolutionary problem solver, and essentially gave it the ability to control the panel. Say, run it through as many circle cycles as you want and to try to determine which panel was producing the biggest range from, let's say, 100 rays down to zero rays, and also which form then was most effective at doing that, what angles were most effective, uh, allowed it to run all its tests, and then took the data and then I looked at the different types of panels, and I saw then actually the diamond panel without backing and the diamond panel with backing were actually performing really well. So I went in and actually ran some more precise tests on those at very specific angles and that. And then interestingly, this was where, when I look at those first forms, as you see, I had three of them had backings on them of an acoustic absorber material. The one without backing actually tended to outperform it. And so I used that information to say, boom, uh, diamonds without backing is the winner. And so the nice thing was I was able to take what would have been physical prototypes that would have taken months to do and do the acoustic testing and turn it five degrees and do the acoustic testing. I was able to run with a parametric engine and they could do it in a matter of hours and come up with the results. So since I had a successful run, we went to a physical prototype then to determine the actual capabilities of this in the real world. So I did a digital model uh, based off those original prototype designs. And then that went into fabrication. And so then I actually built this myself out of uh, steel material, some wood, so I could actually do the testing of it. And I think, how are we doing on time? Right now? Good, good. So, um, and so this was the original first prototype right here, the precursor to the one you see out here. And this got taken over for physical testing. Uh, this was actually um, uh, Vance Brashears, who actually teaches one of the acoustic courses here, was nice enough to help me out. We laid out a really simple test method, um, just did it in their conference room, but he's like, oh, this works, pink noise generator, and do impulse response test on it. Um, Vance running it. And so the fantastic thing was, and I was explaining this, I, I think it was either Ben or <laughs> we were talking with Casey, is, uh, we were finishing the testing, and then he showed me the graph before they had nice lines that kind of highlight the color, what was the difference. And he was clicking back and forth between the two tests and going, yeah, look at this. Wow, look at that. And it's like, so this is good, right? And he said, this is fantastic. So I had that first initial validation of what I had done, which was the fact that it's able, the panel is able to do a 12 decibel drop, which is huge. That's like going from a vacuum cleaner to somebody talking. And he's like, if this one panel can do it, this could actually be quite successful. Um, like as an acoustic product, essentially, as something that could be applied in the real world. Um, so this is another graph that kind of shows the difference there. That's a very significant change. And so this is something that we kind of talked about, how do you quantify the, or qualify this, really? And so that's when you look back to that chart of absorptive materials, what the panel is doing is it's changing from the equivalent of polished concrete, so if you're standing in front of a wall of them, as if the wall was built of polished concrete, and as the panels are opening, it's as if suddenly the wall was made out of three-inch foam. And it, I, what I always really like is everybody has that ability. You can close your eyes, and with me talking, you're like, well, I think the wall's about 30 feet away this way. This wall sounds like brick. We can all do that. And so that's always what's been exciting to me is to see this one go over in the future and let people experience not the lighting or the, the cooling or the, the, you know, whatever, the aperture openings of the, the windows changing, but the sound changing around it, I think, could be really exciting. And let's see. And so we went into prototype two, uh, more digital modeling. Uh, this allowed me to go through. I had a fabricator actually do water jetting on this one instead of me with the shears, so we got better results. <coughs> so he actually, this was a fun one, too. So this was actually a collaborative, interactive model on uh, Onshape software. And so they were able to open it and on my end, too, and we can manipulate it. And so that was very successful there. Cut sheets for the laser and created prototype two, which is the one you see out here. And I'm not running it right now uh, out there, but you can see this is what, when it goes through its actuation cycle. This is actually video from when we were doing our testing. 
And so prototype two has gone out for testing with uh, impulse response testing in an open air environment. It's been working really well too. And so this is another, you can see there's a drop, significant drop between when the panel is reflective and when the panel is absorptive. And this is, if you can see my, this might call it a cheap animation by clicking between the two. And again, this is another one of those where an acoustic engineers are like, oh, that's fantastic. I'm like, what do you mean? Well, look at this, look. <laughs> so, so I thought I should show you as well, because they were excited. <laughs> uh, so this is a quick shot uh, from the testing process. And so that's what this is all gonna go forward and get, and we're gonna continue to develop this into an actual product. But uh, since we're having a discussion about um, technology, parametrics, digital fabrication, that type of thing, um, this is what actually drives that whole ray trace engine. And uh, a lot of this is actually VB code sections that I wrote. And so right now what it does is it produces uh, this. So we can put this ray in environment. I did like a little concert hall thing. And you can see where this is as we reduce the absorbency of the surfaces, it can actually extend the amount of those rays, which to me could really be an exciting thing because then I can give somebody parametric control of the concert hall and so they can do the same thing. They can evolutionarily go through and raise and lower the balcony decks and move them around, change the absorbency of the surfaces, and really start to learn about it and let it become a fitness test where it can actually improve the acoustics instead of we built the building and now we're going to come in and try to fix the problems we created. So, so there we go. This is, so that's the, going to be the new one, Transform Acoustics. All right, thank you guys very much. Appreciate the time.